ground I'd make my nest in my pretty one's breast And I never ever would come down No, I never It's Friday morning, September 17th. This episode of Real Talk is presented by our friends at Bitcoin Well, proudly headquartered out of Edmonton, rapidly growing. This team is the first publicly traded Bitcoin ATM company on planet Earth. You're going, Bitcoin ATM? What's that all about? Why do I need an ATM if I can just buy and sell Bitcoin with an app? That's a great question. And they'd love to give you what's a pretty bang on answer. I know because I asked them that question myself a couple months ago. You can find Adam and his entire team through the link on the sponsors page on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. This is a tough one, friends, this morning. You probably know because uh, she reached iconic status over the past number of of months. And uh, I'm going to say over the past number of years, uh, uh, Julie Rohr, a very dear friend of this show, uh, a member of our editorial board. As a matter of fact, the founding member of our editorial board, uh, a remarkable human being, a wife, a sister, a mother, a niece, a daughter, a community league contributor. I mean, just a remarkable human being. In the words of uh, her family, by way of a tweet yesterday, uh, traded her earthly clothing for that of the eternal universe yesterday. Uh, as a matter of fact, just yesterday morning. And we're going to, uh, out of the gates this morning here on the show, honor her memory and honor her contributions to public dialogue. And, I mean, that seems like such a formal way to describe what Julie Rohr did for all of us. Look no further than the hashtag we love Julie Rohr, R-O-H-R. It started trending uh, a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, as, as Julie shared with the public that she had entered hospice care. She'd been fighting for a number of years on and off a very rare form of cancer. It was a cancer of the soft tissue. Uh, so rare, in fact, that only about one in a million people uh, would be diagnosed with uh, the the challenging situation. I mean, just a horrific battle that Julie endured. Uh, of course, chemotherapy and, and and different types of therapies and surgeries, multiple surgeries, uh, multiple organs impacted. But still, through it all, as you know, this remarkable attitude and uh, almost an unfathomable perspective. I mean, just the the grace that she displayed and the positivity that that she uh, exuded. I mean, it's almost beyond description. You know, if you ever had a chance to talk to her or if you followed her on Twitter, the impact that Julie had on people. She, you know, we've been reading, uh, prompted by a real talker named Tanya. We've started every show this week with a positive reflection around Julie. Uh, Typically, Kubi Energy sponsors our positive reflections the first show of the week. It's usually on a Monday, and, and we get the week started right with stories that fill our buckets, so to speak, with stories that provide encouragement, uh, people paying it forward and random acts of kindness. And Tanya said, with everything going on and how many people are talking about Julie, you know, why don't we start every day this week reflecting on her? And you have responded en masse. I mean, it wasn't lost on me yesterday. Do you know what? Can I say it wasn't planned yesterday? I realized it as it was happening that I read an email from uh, from someone of the Jewish faith that wrote in to talk about the impact that Julie had on them, and the next email I read was was someone of the Muslim faith that talked about the impact that Julie had on her, and Julie was a woman of faith, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, she's, she's literally bringing people together from different faiths, not the only person on planet Earth to accomplish it, but it's not something we always see. Julie was very good friends with people that would lean left politically, and she had very close friends of people that lean right, and sometimes people couldn't even wrap their minds around it, how how she was able to to wear her heart on her sleeve and speak so frankly and issue challenges to elected officials and community leaders when they needed it, and she would almost hold court. 
Julie wasn't the prime minister. Or she wasn't the you know the CEO of, of something. But but when she spoke, people would say, "I know this because I participated in these conversations." Did you see what Julie Rohr had to say about it? And she reached this iconic status where celebrities around the world started sending messages of encouragement. I want to play one from Colin Mockery here in just a second. Celebrated comedian, and Julie was a big fan of his. I mean, Ryan Reynolds chimed in, and Eugene Levy and Chantal Kreviasek, you know, played a show for them. And there were so many people, Connor McDavid, the Oilers superstar, so many people releasing these videos. I mean, here, here's one example. Here's Colin Mockery from just a few days ago. Hey there, Julie. Colin Mockery from Whose Line Is It Anyway here, international comedy icon and, of course, dream boyfriend to everyone living in the world right now, except for those two people in Red Deer. Don't ask. Uh, oh, I was also uh, Brad Pitt's body double in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's true. Don't even look it up. It's true. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but you have just turned the Twitterverse on its ear. I hope you know how much you are loved and admired and respected for all you have done. Um, not only... Um, loved and respected, but you have inspired people to do the same. You have inspired people to send that love and joy out across the world. You will become a true immortal. I just want to thank you for everything you have done to make this place a better world. You are a rare and special person, and um, I'm just sending you all of my love. Stay strong. Isn't that beautiful? From Colin Mockery. Yesterday, Edmonton's Mayor Don Iveson officially proclaimed it. And it's an actual thing. When a mayor makes a proclamation, it's printed out and it's read and it is proclaimed. Julie Rohr Week in Edmonton. And I was thrilled to see that. We heard uh, when, when we announced just a few days ago, uh, with Julie's blessing, the Real Talk Julie Rohr Scholarship, which will benefit at least one post-secondary student who has lost a parent to cancer, and we will award it annually, and we'll have details on that in the weeks and months to come. I heard from former Edmonton Poet Laureate Mary Pinkowski, who wrote a poem for Julie and gave me permission to share it with you. It's called Love Wins. Mary writes, Julie, you beaming, bursting beacon of courage and hope, you brilliant miracle of a lighthouse. What a tremendous life you have built. Yours is a place where community knows no bounds, where to serve is holiness. You have offered up your body as a graceful gift to others in the lessons of understanding and acceptance. Your voice is a tender mix of siren, call, and balm. Your smile, an open house we all want to live in. Your heart, a wild river running ferociously into compassion. And your soul, beautiful and light-filled, untouched by disease. That's the place where you honor us from. You told a story once about telling your son the cancer had returned. You said you were under blue skies. You tell of diving under the water, of trying to hear his strong little body screaming swears. I imagine that some days, these days, it must feel as if you're still underwater, trying to understand questions that are too big for us to answer, like why or when for me the beauty of your story is that you both popped your heads up from the water left what you needed to leave in that pool surrounded by nature let the water and the earth take what it needed to take hold what it needed to hold and you emerged baptized with the beautiful wisdom that your strong and light-filled spine has knit itself to the backbones of your family and community forever They will shine. They are shining just as bright as you are hoping. The Bible tells us that God fashioned us from clay. Julie, I'm thinking of you now on these days when it might feel like your body is more like clay returned to its component parts, losing its form, yet returning to its essence. Your essence is what binds us to you. Your essence is what makes love win. Your essence is love. Julie, we are the honored recipients of the gifts of your grace, the ones who have been blessed by your light. We are thinking of you now, Julie, and my God, aren't we the fortunate ones? That's Love Wins by Mary Pinkowski. When a family member uh, shared yesterday 
a personal and tender moment. It's heartbreaking. But a moment that Julie's son Max shared with his mom where he he lay with her in her hospice bed the night before she passed and said, I know what's going to happen. And it's okay to let go now, mommy. Julie Rohr will leave an indelible mark on so many of us on this show. And we're so grateful to have known her. Sculptor Slavo Czech joined us yesterday to share how his online auction of a beautiful piece had raised through the contributions of three incredible art collectors, $15,000 for the Real Talk Julie Rohr Scholarship. I'm thrilled to let you know that those pendants, the beautiful chaos pendants that Slavo Czech talked about yesterday on the show, sold out. He took orders from 50 of you. As a matter of fact, 51. He accepted one more, he told, because it meant a lot. I know that many of Those orders are going to Real Talkers because you're telling us right now in the live chat, it means another $5,000 going to that scholarship. This scholarship fund is already at $20,000, and we haven't even released details on it. We're going to do something special in her honor. I had a private conversation with Julie that I'll never forget just a number of days ago about the scholarship, who she'd like to receive it, who she'd like to award it, And we'll be sharing those details with you. I encourage you to circle on your calendars Thursday, June 23rd of next year. It'll be the first annual Real Talk Golf Tournament at the Ranch Golf and Country Club. And it'll be, of course, in honor of Julie and to raise funds for that scholarship initiative. And we're really excited for what we know is going to be a a wonderful day. We're going to make sure there's pictures of her all over the place because her smile just makes me smile. Every time I see her smile, I think this, first of all, needs to be up as a mural. We're going to get that smile painted somewhere. I'll guarantee you that. And it'll be a wonderful day. It's hard to believe that Julie was on this show just 10 days ago. Nine days before she passed. And if you already saw that interview, I don't think you'll mind seeing a portion of it again. And if you haven't, it's an honor to share it with you now. And it began with me asking Julie, who was checking in with us from her hospice home, where she was finding her strength. Where am I finding this strength? Well, I I was raised as a very little girl in a very big church to believe that I am one of a greater community. I am not just here for my own gain in this world. I'm not living here for my own desires. And um, I, I lean upon the strength of love, love for my family, love from the greater community um, and, and my faith journey, really. Um, my spirituality has been a big thing for me to lean upon during these years. And that's really kind of where I get this, like the peace during my own journey towards death really i mean we're all on a journey towards death some of us know it and some of us don't think about it but um but through this whole thing um that's been a real anchor for me is uh just my my own spiritual experience as well so Hmm. is i I oftentimes last guess and it's and it's typically not an interview that's as uh real as this i mean this is this is about as real as real talk gets julie i mean uh, even even the opening statement on your Twitter thread where you say, I am an end stage cancer patient. It just hits you like a ton of bricks when you read that. Um, but I oftentimes will ask people at the end of an interview, if, you know, to, to give us something to walk with and to give us something to think about and to meditate on and to grow from. Is there something you can, I mean, you know that thousands of people are going to be listening to this interview and are going to be walking with this podcast. What's something you want us to walk with? Yeah, this is what I would say today. Um, when Jen um, started that thread of people posting things that they loved about me, which I had no prior knowledge of, like you said. Um, and as I was, I mean, I was in the hospital while I was reading the thread and um, I, I was just blown away. Absolutely. And what I would say is it was like being at 
a memorial service before I'm gone. I got to hear what, you know, what kind of impact that my life has had on people. And I had no idea. I, I, I truly didn't know. And so what I would say is, you know, if you love something about someone, if you admire someone, tell them that. Don't wait until a later time, you know, tell them throughout your experience, walk, walk through life with an open, open heart and open hands. And, you know, just be honest with people and vulnerable. And it's amazing what will change in your perspective and your daily life. If you're walking in that gratitude and that um, community, that sense of community. The absolutely beautiful and incredible Julie Rohr. A dear friend of this show, a dear friend I know to so many of you. May she rest in power. We're going to be talking about child care in just a moment. I know that's something that was important to Julie. She had a lot of comments on it, what meaningful child care would look like. Before we get into that, I want to remind you that if you're going to be heading out of town in the next little bit, you can consider a trip to Palm Springs now because out of Edmonton International Airport, you can fly nonstop starting December 16th, nonstop from Alberta's capital city to Palm Springs. While you're doing it, why not park your money in the bank and park your car at JetSet? If you go to JetSetParking.com right now and enter the promo code REALTALK, You can park your car for $8 a day for any travel by the end of 2022. You can book it now for any travel until the very end of next year for $8 a day with the promo code REALTALK at JetSetParking.com. JetSet Parking is locally owned and you'll love them. Our friends at Explore Edmonton are so excited to be welcoming Rugby Sevens to Alberta's capital. This is quite likely a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This tour stop was supposed to touch down in the UK, but Rugby Sevens is on its way to Edmonton because that didn't happen. It's a one-off stop. The 2021 series will kick off with a pair of men's events in Canada. Vancouver got one. Edmonton gets the other at Commonwealth Stadium on September 25th and 26th. Grab your costumes Grab the flags of the country or countries you want to cheer for and come join this once-in-a-lifetime party. It's seven players playing seven-minute halves. It's fast, it's fun, and it's for everyone. What an amazing opportunity to introduce yourself to a new sport, maybe forge some new traditions. It's a dynamic, high-octane style and an obvious festival atmosphere. You can learn more about Rugby Sevens presented by Explore Edmonton at CanadaSevens.com. Well, we spoke briefly earlier this week about an open letter uh, signed by 50 prominent Canadian women calling on all political parties to prioritize affordable child care. Cindy Blackstock signed it. Former Deputy PM Sheila Copps signed it. Uh, Former Crown Prosecutor and columnist Sandy Garasino signed it. Sapria Duvetti, good friend of this show, signed it. Kathleen Wynne, Ontario's former Premier, signed it. And so did economist Dr. Lindsay Teds an associate professor in the Department of Economics, uh, fully seconded to the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. It's great, Dr. Ted's, to welcome you to the show this morning, and thanks for making time for us. Welcome to Real Talk. Thank you very much for having me. When did you first hear about this letter? How, how long did it take for you to decide to agree to sign it? So it was sent to me by um, Kate Graham, um, who is in uh, Ontario, uh, and she, she and I have certainly been commiserating on Twitter about um, child care. Uh, I received the email. I signed it 30 seconds later <laughs> um, because I've been uh, quite vocal about the issues of child care well before the pandemic, uh, uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, mostly because I, I experience um, these issues. I have an eight-year-old. I've navigated the system from start to now. Uh, and it is a it is an issue that is poorly understood and is frequently represented as a fringe in- issue as opposed to something that actually affects, you know, a significant portion of the population. While this letter was signed by moms, it would be great to see dads uh, engage in a similar initiative. 
do, do you think the letter was uh, necessary? I mean, are you are you looking right now at party platforms and, and going, what the hell? I mean, is that basically the gist of it? I've been looking at party platforms for a long time and always saying, what the hell? Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think this is one of these ones where, you know, we have the typical conservative approach to things, which is, hey, let's just throw money at people and that solves problems. Well, no, actually, money doesn't solve all problems. And we need to make sure that we understand when money can work and when we actually, as a society, have to provide that public service to ensure that everybody can participate in in society. This is a participation issue, without a shadow of a doubt. I guarantee you that people are going to hear that Dr. Ted's is on Real Talk, and they're going to see, because we've got to let you have a commitment at nine. I promise I'm going to get you out of here in eight minutes. <laughs> and so they're going to realize right now that they're going to be able to get a synopsis of the three big party platforms on child care in eight minutes, and you're going to be able to drive their understanding of this issue. No pressure, Doc. So why don't we get into this first? Why don't we get into the liberals? They're the ones that have been trying to cut the deals with the provinces. They're the ones that have the, the big plan of the $10 a day child care countrywide. How do you assess their plan and what do people, parents, voters need to know? Well, um, I, I think it's important to disclose that I am on the federal task force for women in the economy that's cha- chaired by the, you see now this, uh, now I get tenses. I mean, she was the deputy prime minister, is she still? Anyway, Christian Freeland. Um, and even before we went into the budget, because we started meeting in February, this was top priority. And I think something that people forget was that the child care deals that have been signed by this government since 2017 have actually been moving us in the, this direction. Those agreements were, in fact, setting up various provinces to roll out different kind of um, pilots for uh, early childhood education. Um, and that is what has put us in a place to be able to have signed eight deals um, within uh, two or three months of the budget being tabled. So I, I think people need to be more careful about saying that the Liberals haven't been doing anything since 2015. That is not true. We have been able to put in, like British Columbia, where I lived for 10 years before I moved here, um, because of that 2017 deal, was able to start rolling out their $10 a day plan. So what this does is build on all of that that um, network and uh, ensures that all licensed, regulated child care spots that are already available in provinces hit a 50% on average 50% fee reduction by the end of 2022, with many provinces uh, committing to hitting that well before that target deadline. And ten dollars, an average of ten dollars a day by 2026. Again, many are going to hit that target well in advance of that. But it also ensures that we are investing in the human capital that is needed to provide high quality early childhood education. And so there's also labor market agreements that go with this to ensure that we are training ECE providers, many of who have a bachelor's degree in early childhood education and really should not be paid $15 an hour. And the only reason why they're paid $15 an hour is because we do not value care in the free market. Okay, let's get so to your, assen- pardon me. Yeah. Uh, let's get to your assessment of the conservative plan. Uh, conserv- if I can say the, the, my overhead view, my, my basic understanding of it is, is sort of that conservative ideology, which in some circumstances, I, I think a lot of people think is, is astute, uh, where they say, we think that parents know how to spend their money the best. And so we're going to make sure that we keep more of your money in your pockets, right? Except for it, in this case, so this is a refundable tax credit, right? Conservatives loves tax credit. So um, what you have to do is incur all of those expenses in advance, and then you can apply at tax time uh, to get that reimbursement. But there's a, a fairly le- clear formula and what your reimbursement is going to be. You cannot um, submit anything more than $8,000 in child care expenses. And at most, if you're at the lowest income levels, you've got $6,000 back. And at the higher um, threshold, it's uh, as as little as $2,000 a year 
back. Now, the Conservatives do say that they're going to roll out a way for you to be able to get that money in real time. That is a very unusual way for a refundable tax credit to work. So I imagine what they're going to do is put in place something like what we have for the Canada Worker Benefit, where you can pre- um, apply and qualify for some stream of payment, but they have absolutely no details on how they're going to do that. The NDP plan, what do people need to know about it? I would, I would say the NDP plan, which we don't actually have a lot of details about, uh, would be probably very, very similar to what the Liberal, what we have is the Liberal plan. Um, and so that is about spaces. Now, I'll just put out, because I know I, I don't have a lot of time, that really the best approach is not an either or approach. And that is in fact what we have in Quebec. We have um, uh, heavily subsidized licensed regulated spaces, but not everybody wants those. And so then we have a refundable tax credit for those parents who instead want to exercise choice. This doesn't have to be either or. The only people who've set this up are the parties themselves. So are you saying that maybe it's a scenario and, and maybe the metaphor will follow apart you might be able to poke a bunch of holes in it as an expert on tax policy public economics and public policy design and implementation so i hesitate but to, but is it maybe like a jurisdiction that has a robust and well-funded public school system that also allows for parents uh, to put their kids into private school with some subsidy from public coffers it's almost like maybe early childhood education is, should be part of the school system <laughs> And in fact, that is what we what it should be. And in fact, other provinces like Alberta is a little behind the eight ball here. I mean, Ontario already has JK and and uh, the junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten. We absolutely need to look at this issue as early childhood education and not just babysitting or child care. This is about our kids, their brain development, the development of social skills, uh, and it's about our future labor force. I'm just going to need you to clarify, Doctor, before we let you go i mean you say alberta's a bit behind the eight ball but i could give you 46 reasons why alberta's behind the eight ball right now what specifically did you mean there sorry so kindergarten here is two hours and 26 minutes a day <laughs> Uh, and only a, a, every other Friday. And in fact, a, a, as a parent who's navigated this, the most stressful year of my life was actually when he was in kindergarten, trying to navigate getting before care, after care. How am I going to get him to school? Because there's never um, care in the schools. It was incredibly complex. And it just wasn't a, it wasn't a conducive environment to anybody's learning. Dr. Lindsay Teds, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Economics uh, and an economist at the University of Calgary. Thanks for making time for us. Have a great weekend. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Bye -bye. And uh, hey, hey, that uh, Hoyles, this is just let the record show. Uh, I can wrap up an interview on time from time to time. Thank you. You're very welcome. There are some questions about my commitment to the clock. <laughs> And this has oftentimes reared its ugly head, pushing people right up to the... Christia Freeland was an example yesterday. I think her team was starting to be like, you know, there are also other people that would like to speak with her today. Yeah, but... But I'm know. even realizing as I'm hearing Dr. Ted's talk... Do the Ted's, Ted's talk. talk? The Ted's talk! I think we know what the title will be on our YouTube file today. Yeah. <laughs> That's more of like a strategist's type wordplay. The the stars of the strategists uh, are coming up with us, Zane, Corey, and Stephen, in just a moment. Uh, but hearing Dr. Ted's talk about, uh, um, you know, former Deputy PM Freeland, who I'm sure would, would like that role again, and Minister of Finance, she's campaigning, of course, to, to defend her seat in Toronto. She joined us yesterday. If you missed that interview, you can find it. I think I have no problem saying this. I think I blew it a little bit yesterday on that interview. I should have mm -hmm. spent more time asking asking Christy Freeland about about child care and uh, you know she's a mom minister of finance and, and maybe we didn't talk about that enough this is this is one of those things though it's a federal election I mean you you, you could talk about a million things um, and we're doing our best on the show to cover as, as you're doing a great job of it but it's kind of like whack-a-mole right like all of a sudden this pops up and this pops up and you're trying to stay on top of it were either of you ever really good at that game whack-a-mole do you know what I'm talking about yes I do you know the game I mean 
I know, I know the game you mean. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I mean, the thing about whack a moles is like you need to be in an arcade to play it and they need to have whack a mole. I think I've probably played whack a mole like four times in my life. In other words, it's, yes, you can't like yeah. have it in your basement and really practice it. You know, they see these days, uh, a friend of mine, she trains uh, hockey players, including goaltenders, and they have these amazing new, they have these walls. Imagine just mm. like a big wall with these circles that these LED, LED lights that flash, and, and the goaltenders got to like hit them with, with their hand. As the light flashes, you hit. It's kind of like the new. It's like digital whack a mole to work on their <laughs> reflexes. Really amazing stuff. Um, perhaps I should get focused again because I think that some real talkers are expecting us to maybe discuss a pennant, a Calgary Stampede pennant today, oh. right? Maybe we'll get into that with the strategist in just a second. First of all, because this is a podcast that supports itself through advertising, we want to remind you. That's a little shot at the guys coming up. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> we want to remind you how proud we are to partner with the team at Grand Dog Essentials. It's a family-owned business that's putting out, in, in my opinion, the best dog food on the market. It's quality raw food, and you can learn more about it at granddog.ca, including a blog section. The team reached out to me earlier this week to let me know that on their blog page at granddog.ca, you can read what your dog's poop is telling you. That's right. You can learn about how your dog's guts are doing. As you're picking up after them in the backyard, unless you're one of those lucky folks that hires a team to come in there. You know that there are services. You there bring are. them in. Maybe but we could get them as an advertiser. The thing I, I don't get, that would be amazing. I mean, you think about the branded content. Amazing. I mean, you think about the, uh, I mean, you think about the plays on words, doing doggy dropping ads all the time. I wonder though, before the, you know, the, those companies, don't worry, Grand Dog, we'll get back to you in a second. <laughs> But when you're waiting for the company to show up, if like they show up on Thursdays or something, like what does your yard look like on Wednesday? You know what I mean? But I have to say that they're not coming every day. No, they're not coming every day. No. But I, I just, I like, I'm talking about poop. I mean, as a dog owner, everyone talks about poop. It's, you, it's like, real life. You want to know, like, what does it look like? Yeah. Did, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you can find you can find out a lot of things from your dog. Like sometimes oh, in the poop, yeah. you'll find like Hot Wheels toys. I'll find like, you know, sort of twisted up pieces of garbage. You're like, I don't know where they found that. Wow. But also the the digestive health of your dog. I know it matters to dog owners. The promo code REALTALK will get you 10% off your first order delivered to your door at granddog.ca. Our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge Jeep want you to know that the brand new Jeep Grand Cherokee L's are in the house. Uh, this is the brand new redesigned SUV. You can see it online. On their websites, you can link to them through the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. The first time that the best-selling SUV in global history has featured a third row of seating. The seven-seater Jeep Grand Cherokee L available now at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge Jeep. And a shout-out to our friends at Athabasca University. They, it's been back to school for them, too, but, but here's the deal. It's different than brick and mortar. You know that. Athabasca U is Canada's online university on demand on your schedule. You can find out more about how AU works, learn about their programs and courses and the admissions process. Plus, if you have a question, you can contact them through a very easy to navigate help and contact link at AthabascaU.ca. Every Friday, we bring you our Real Talk Roundtable. It's a tradition, has been since inception, and one of our most wildly popular roundtables occurred back in February, where our next guests made their Real Talk debut. The three of them joined forces every week to put out one of Canada's most popular political podcasts, The Strategists, and we're thrilled to have them joining us this morning. All right, that's enough platitudes. Stephen Carter, we need more. Zane Velge, Corey Hogan, yeah. welcome back to Real Talk. Jespo, thank Yo. you for having us. Can I just ask, was our lead-in dog shit? <laughs> that's what I that's what I thought it was, and I just wanted yeah. you to clarify. If you want to give them more airtime, I'll let you, but I just wanted to clarify that the lead-in to us uh, was dog shit. Not actually, yeah. Not actually that. It was actually dogs eating garbage and then shitting it out. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Corey, Corey convinced me to do to do the podcast today. He said, we got to go help Jesperson. Yes. We got to give him the old strategist bump. But I had no idea that, you know, you'd lost DQ and you're falling to dog shit. This is a real bad moment for you. I'm sorry. Unless that was some sort of a bit just to embarrass us. It could have been a bit. I don't know. Was it a bit? Please, God. 
Just say it was a bit. When you have Just to, say it. when you have to explain your jokes, uh, they're no longer jokes. <laughs> And so I would. I was hoping to just, as you do, oh. drop it and let it lie. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. wait well, till Thursday, perfect. till the company shows up to pick it up. Just let it lie. Uh, fellas, I appreciate what you do uh, to keep us in the loop when it comes to all things politics. I'm excited that Zane gets to be on the flip side now, typically asking the questions. Now we're going to treat you like one of the panelists i want to get uh, right to this um i'll be serious for a second because it's deadly serious alberta leads the country in covid cases hospitalizations uh icu admissions alberta's chief medical officer of health who's experiencing her own credibility problems right now with the public uh telling physicians earlier this week that this is undeniably a result of alberta's best summer ever plan which kicked off on july 1st paving the way for pancake parties at the calgary stampede the premier jason kenney with his sorry not sorry address earlier this week and then last night on his home turf his safe space facebook live speaking to albertans but it wasn't what he said so much as what he or his team tacked up on the wall behind him that has everybody fucking pissed right now a 1919 victory calgary stampede pennant who wants to go first on this one Corey? over to you well i mean this is this is kind of a pugilistic instinct that has not served the premier well in the past. So I'm not sure why he's decided to double, triple, quadruple down on, on this kind of approach to politics. I have it. It's impossible to me that knowing the the production that goes into those things and the numbers of people that are in the room when you do something like a Facebook Live, it, like it, you can't tell me it's an accident. I guess that's what I would say. Somebody would say. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Premier, uh, you know how hundreds of people have unnecessarily died? Just a little FYI for you here. Might be in, might be in poor taste. And by the way, if, if you're the Calgary Stampede, you want that like you want a kick to the head as well. So not doing a lot of favors to one of the uh, major institutions here in the, the great city of Calgary, uh, renowned mostly for being better than the city of Edmonton. So I think... Um, I think it's it's really hard to imagine what was going on in their minds that they did that, but it's a clear signal. They intend to fight. They intend to revise uh, history as as aggressively as they possibly can, and they're not going to, um, you know, they're not going to, uh, you know, apologize. Go go limply forward. They're gonna they're gonna fight. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's essentially. I mean, well, let me ask you this, Card. I'll let you put it in your words. When you were chief of staff to, to Premier Allison Redford, would, would, would you have, in in your wildest dreams, ever allowed her or suggested or, or or maybe manifested a move like this to send a message? No, but I bet you're all wishing you had a sky palace now, hey? <laughs> I mean, this is this is ridiculous. What's happening? I mean, there's a huge. Uh, uh, pandemic and, and they're behaving like children. I mean, during the depths of the Allison Redford days, uh, as much as you may have criticized her, her office didn't behave like children. Someone choosing to put this pendant up is, is, is saying, fuck you to Albertans at a time when Albertans are in hospitals at a higher rate than ever before, in ICUs at a higher rate than ever before, and dying in unconscionable numbers. I mean, the only reason that we weren't at a higher rate than usual is because Kenny had all his comorbidities passing away in the in the second wave. All the, all the weak people, according to Kenny, were dying, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Well, now they're not weak people. You'll note that the comorbidities reporting seems to have disappeared. We're no longer reporting, oh, this person's 80 and smoked all their lives. That's because 20-year-olds are dying. 20-year-olds are dying. So uh, the premier thinks it's funny, though. The premier thinks it's funny. The premier and his team think it's absolutely hilarious, and they're going to put a, a stampede pennant up in, you know, in the bottom corner. Uh, victory in 1919. Give me a break. First of all, the, the First World War was heinous challenge for Canadian for for the world and to just mock it by dragging it into this as well like give me a break this is the world's worst communications team with what could be the worst premier in Canadian history well and Carter let's not forget 1919 as well like the height of the Spanish flu in Canada too I mean it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's I mean, worth mentioning right Zane that was that one when I saw 1919 uh, Carter I, I appreciate you invoking the first world war and it's and it's worth noting how many te- you know how many tens of thousands of Canadians died there but 1919 I mean that's pandemic territory maybe there's even more to this from this comms team than we give them credit for Zane yeah, listen, I feel like more than anything, more than even wanting to save his premiership uh, with the lowest poll numbers of any premier in this country, Jason Kenney wants to be the new dictionary definition of gaslighting. 
Well, congratulations, Jason. You've done it, you and your team. I mean, this was witnessing that yesterday, even if it was a mistake, holy shit. Like, what are you trying to do, man? Like, what are you trying to signal? And Corey talked about pugilism. Let me talk to you about pugilism and fighting in two streams, right? First, that he's going to fight back. But secondly, and perhaps we could discuss this, Ryan, uh, the fight that he's always had internally within his team, right? He does one thing, you know, there's this thing in Hollywood, right? Where, where big stars have said, I'm going to make one movie for myself and mo one movie for the studios. And I feel like Jason. He was probably making a good point, right, fellas? <laughs> really good point. <laughs> he should, I mean, he, he should. He you should guys, pay no, sorry, Zane, you dropped out on us. You make one for the for yourself. You make one for the studio and you feel like Jason Kenny is. I feel like Jason Kenny is that guy as a premier. He makes something for the right flank. He makes something for the more centrist, reasonable crowd over and over. I'm going to announce these restrictions. They're going to be a half measure. I'm going to put something behind me to speak to the fact that I'm not sorry. I'm going to do a sorry for the people that think that I should be sorry, but I'm also going to fuck you. I'm not sorry for the people who feel like we're actually going too far. It is that unbelievable balancing act that he has failed for months now that he's for some reason keeps continuing and it is going to be his ultimate demise. I, it is going to be what takes him down going forward. I would rather, and I, and I hate to say this, as a progressive person, rather have a premier who's dedicated to the right flank of his party and says, this is the lane I've picked, fuck it, these are my people, than someone who's doing what Jason Kenney is doing, which is this temperamental one for you, one for me, one for you, one for them sort of activity uh, over the course of the last several months. Well, yeah I, mean, yeah, I mean, it's one of those classic, you try to ride two horses and see what happens <laughs> to your mid parts, right? It's not gonna- Unless you're Van Damme, unless you're Jean-Claude Van Damme in that <laughs> truck commercial, you're, you can't do it. Yeah. No, but but you're absolutely right. It's it's one of these things where there's no coherence to the policy right now, and it's coming out as a word salad as a result. You you saw that on Thursday. I mean, I think Graham Thompson wrote an article about this, and he was spot on. It was the sorry, not sorry, uh, lockdown, not lockdown. I mean, contradiction was the name of the game, and it's an extension of this tactics-driven politics that we've seen from uh, not just Jason Kenney, but politicians just in general, especially on the right of the spectrum over the last bit. And the idea is... You say a bunch of stuff and you package the stuff that, that, you know, to individual groups that they need to hear. It doesn't work in big moments where everybody's watching, right? When you've got hundreds of thousands of people on like an Alberta.ca website trying to watch a news conference, you can't then take it and unbundle it and give it to the different people uh, as you see fit. This is this long tail approach to politics was very successful for Stephen Harper. Doesn't work in these Churchillian moments where you've got to stand up and be a leader. This is a, it's been interesting to see so many people invoke Churchill, Corey, right? Because Jason yeah. Kenny has indicated such a clear admiration for it. Carter, you just burst out laughing there. I want you to take the floor. I mean, Jason Kenny sees himself as Churchill, but I mean, Neville Chamberlain has more character and spine and backbone than, than Jason Kenny at this point. I mean, uh, Chamberlain didn't see the rise of the Nazis and, uh, you know, ha or wanted to placate them. Uh, and Jason Kenny just is, is saying, like, I don't. I don't see the fourth wave. I'm not going to allow it to happen. He seemed to will it and want to will it out of existence, exactly like Cham Chamberlain. And, and the end now, what we need is an actual premier. We need an actual minister who's going to be doing the things that are, are in the best interests of Albertans. And, you know, for people who are saying there is no real need for government anymore. I mean, there is. Right. It doesn't matter which party you choose. They're always going to fuck us. Uh, not true. Now we actually see that there are parties that do a worse job and I can't imagine even even when comparing to Doug Ford, even comparing to the or to Brian Pallister, you, you know, the same brand characteristics, you you see a massive difference between Jason Kenney and his fellow uh, conservatives. Uh, Jason Kenney is the worst of the breed. And uh, we have to wait for another 18 to, to 20 months uh, before we get to end this uh, conservative experiment. Zane, you're you're all talking about, you know, riding the two horses. I don't know. I got this extremely vivid visual when you talked about what happens about the mid parts. It was really gnarly. <laughs> uh, we, But it allows for me to really process the metaphor. But it doesn't work, does it? Because if you're a progressive conservative, you don't want to 
vote, you know, let, let me say on premise, you don't want to vote for the NDP, but you're in a position where you're going, if I'm going to support the United Conservatives, I mean, if I'm going to vote for, you know, donate to them or campaign or knock doors for them or ultimately vote for them, it means I'm either giving them a pass or plugging my nose and moving beyond a lot of these stunts, a lot of these kind of frat boy moments, the, you know, the, the, the Matt Wolf putting up the Canadian oil and gas sign in the, mm-hmm. in the window mm-hmm. when Greta touches down. And, I mean, this kind of stuff, the frat boy kind of stuff. And, 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 and if I'm that type of person, let me say I am one of those types of people, a small P, small C, progressive conservative that mm-hmm. says there's no fucking way that this guy's getting my vote ever. It doesn't work. And then you're placating the centrists and the right wingers are saying, well, it doesn't work for us either. In what universe is this actually effective? You're eroding both sides of your coalition, right? Like, so let's just say, let's just say you had a coalition to begin with that was unanimous in your leadership. And I would argue that premise, right? Because as we, we don't need to go through the history with, with this audience, but this is two parties glued together, right? And there are seams and those seams are now becoming fractured. So there's already natural fracture points within the UCP. You then stop pleasing the former PC crowd of the early and mid 2000s. And then you have the Wild Rose crowd on the right flank, which is through through both time and additional pressure, I would say radicalized itself even more to the right. So maybe you as the leader of the UCP could or could not have controlled that. Let's give you a pass on that. But that's your new reality. So you've got a further right flank that just is finding itself uh, in, in a much louder, angrier tone. We see the PPC on a national level trying to take advantage of that. You have these fracture points and no one is satisfied at the end of the day because you aren't actually picking a lane. I know Corey talked about this yesterday on our podcast. I don't want to scoop him on repeating what he says, which is what I usually do for the national TV shows. Yeah, uh, but what, stuff, I, yeah. what I will what I will. What the hell do you think is this that, is, Velji? Uh, it's it's not TV. It's if it if it was. It's the next generation. It's new media. It's the next when generation. do we get our? That's when, do, the when does he get his check? He's asking when does he get his check? <laughs> I, I every not, every for, Thursday, a crew will come over to pick up the dog shit in your yards starting next I, week. I'm so glad. It's good. I'm going to send my kids over to their yards. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> I was just about to leave you space for some more advertising there, Jespo. So I'm glad you you did it as branded content in yeah. between. Uh, the fact you don't pick a lane is harmful. O'Toole has the same sort of problem, I think, in some ways uh, with his with his leadership uh, heading into this federal election. And Kenny has just symbolized it, uh, you know, uh, in, in such a stark way that no one can be happy with you when you don't have any conviction to what you're about. And the fact is that. You know, he's well, some people would say that he's too ideological. The fact is that he's been now trying to balance his ideology with like where the wind blows. And it just is just coming out as an incoherent mess uh, over the course of the last year, I'd say. You know, there's a there's a broader lesson about politics here. A good compromise leaves everybody unhappy. So does a bad compromise. And you can't tell two stories at once. And I think this has been the challenge of some of those upstart political parties we've seen across the board. Not to pick on the Alberta party, but I will for a minute here, which is. You're not a centrist party because you do one left wing thing and one right wing thing. You've got to tell a story about what you want the province to be. And Jason Kenney is not telling a coherent story right now. Uh, Carter, I want to put this one in in front of you. Uh, Jillian with a G says the conservative tent is garbage and there should be two parties. Jillian with a J says this the whole pennant thing, the Calgary Stampede pennant. That's the last straw for me. She says, are there options at this point? Like, what would Kenny resigning mean? Would we elect somebody else or would somebody from the party just get appointed? A lot of people believe that Jason Kenny, his resignation could be imminent. I mean, right around Thanksgiving, other people say there's no way in hell this guy's going to resign. Carter, what do you think? I think for him to resign, he'd have to have a, a gender change. He'd have to be a woman for him to be forced out by this caucus. Um, Alison Redford was forced out for far less. Uh, so, you know, if the caucus hasn't moved to this point, if you're if you're not forcing your premier to resign when people are dying, uh, when he says there's not going to be a return to the fourth wave, when he says we're not prepared, it's not a scenario we can even imagine. <clears throat> what's going to make him resign? He's not resigning. You got to force him out. So we'll see. We'll see if the if the if this uh, cabinet has the wherewithal to remove the mo- least popular premier in uh, in Alberta history. Where, how I don't do you, think the NDP want that to happen. You don't, I don't think, think that? that <clears throat> I don't think so. I no. think that the next leader gets to walk away from uh, all of these problems. We can see an economic rebound, um, you know, with higher oil and gas pro- uh, oil and gas prices. We can see our unemployment rate suddenly dip below two d- double digits. 
um, you know, these things could happen under a different leader and, and the rest of uh, and Alberta would go back to thinking, hey, we're, we're conservatives, we should vote for conservatives um, without really understanding what it is that we you know, value. I mean, even right now, we're, we're still gonna vote conservative, even though uh, the conservatives in our province uh, are very aligned with O'Toole and O'Toole said, this is the best, uh, best program, the best response to uh, COVID in Canada is happening right here in Alberta. Well, I don't think so, but anyways, I mean, all of this to say that if you haven't forced Jason Kenney out by now, what the hell is, what are you waiting for? Show me what you believe. Show me that you value something. And I don't care if you're coming from the right side of your party, like the 17 morons who signed the anti-mask, anti-restriction letter, or you're coming from the left side of your party, like the people who are just sitting there quietly watching as everything is unfolding. Both sides of this party should be absolutely rebelling against this leader. Neither are, and it just tells me that they'd rather try and hold on to power than actually take any action. Corey, who holds the power in the party right now? I mean, is is it the 17 that signed the letter? Is it the, the silent majority? Is the backbenchers right now? Who holds the power that could force the premier out of his leadership role? I don't know. Uh, I, I think that it's the right of the party that has been uh, picking the tune for the last bit. We've seen this trend with COVID response where the premier will only act after everybody else in the province has said, why are you not acting, right? And that, that to me says that it's the group on the right that he's most worried about losing. And frankly, you've seen fewer cracks on the quote unquote left. You've seen Richard Godfrey now say a few very critical things. You've seen Leela here multiple times take rounds out of the uh, premier, although I wouldn't historically have thought of her as on the left of the party. Yeah, I was going to say Godfrey is a lefty. I don't know about that. Yeah. But carry on. Yeah, I mean, but keep in mind, this is where Jason's taking the party too. But I, I guess my point would be her criticism seemed to be coming more from the left at this moment, right? Their criticisms that he's not acting yeah. enough, not being compassionate enough. Uh, so he uh, he's clearly having to manage the right more than he is the left. Uh, and so you've got to say that's where the power is at this particular moment. But ultimately, and this is the great paradox of the UCP, that's that's a sure way to lose an election. You look at the polling right now and you see just under 80 percent of Albertans support vaccine passports. Well, they went out of their way to not call things a vaccine passport two days ago and 20 um, percent strongly opposed to vaccine passports. Well, the language seemed to actually reflect their anxieties. And maybe that's a majority or a plurality within the UCP. And that's why Jason Kenney's acting the way he is. But that'll get him to an election, not through an election. He will absolutely be crushed if he is leading the party in 2023, if he continues to kowtow to the right. Uh, Zane, you, of course, uh, steered a successful uh, campaign for Calgary's outgoing mayor, Nahed Nenshi, and uh, he's been on fire this week um, calling out Jason Kenney, talking about how he doesn't believe that the province is divided. I thought that Nenshi was bang on, quite frankly, and then I think it was yesterday releasing a statement that, you know, he's worked with six other premiers and two Canadian prime ministers, and, and he's never seen anybody like Jason Kenney before. Contrast that with the leader of the official opposition, provincially Rachel Notley, who really hasn't been up on a podium or, or, or using a, a megaphone throughout this. I've had a, a couple of real talkers reach out and say, where is Rachel Notley? Like, why is Rachel Notley not putting out policy what she would be doing? My immediate inclination is to suggest that when your opponent is tying the noose and getting set to hang their own political chances, you don't want to interrupt them and distract them. Is that what's going on with Rachel Notley right now? Even more so, you don't want them to, uh, extending this metaphor, uh, end it, right? You don't want them to leave. You don't want, in many ways, Jason Kenney to be gone. So you saw Rachel Notley yesterday doing the national media circuit. It was a light touch on Jason Kenney. It was a bit of like what the NDP would do, what we would do, you know, how this is a disgrace, how we need vaccine passports. She was very much focused on the issues and the policies, not so much on the person Partly, and I'd say largely perhaps, the reason is that the best chances, as we've discussed, for the NDs in 23 is Jason Kenney, right? Because not only uh, to Carter's point that there's a rebound potential if there's a new leader, there's a rebound and rebrand potential in a couple of years. Two years is a long time. And I'm not saying we're actually super fickle and we're going to forget the Kenny years, but if he's gone, it's hard to say who else a part of that orbit, you'd also kind of focus on. Kenny's gone, the mats are gone, the issues managers are gone. There is a rebrand potential. There's enough runway that conservatism, that which many would say is in the bloodstream of Albertans, whether it's to varying degrees, uh, as the incumbent sort of lean that we have, 
if a rebrand and a rebound is possible for a new leader that steps in, uh, yeah, you might you might take the piss out of Kenny, but guess what? They're going to be running against Kenny as well, running away from him, uh, probably slagging him as much as they can. And that's a world of unpredictability that if you're the team NDs, both from a volunteer, candidate, finance, and viability standpoint, you probably have a lesser chance of winning in 2023 with. So you can look at the lighter touch of, yeah, let me get out of the way and let my opponent torch themselves. But more specifically to this case, I need my opponent to stay. And I know we we witnessed some of this sort of behavior around the Allison Redford years as well, where there were go, 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 go. And then, whoa, let's stop because this is about to happen. We may have pushed it off the edge and, and we need her to stay. And of course, that did not happen because she resigned just weeks later. But we've seen this movie play out uh, in, in the very recent past, Ryan, in Alberta political history as well. It's been uh, it, it's been a, a pleasure for me over the years to provide insight mo- mo- to the three of you, most especially Carter, who wonder things like sort of as a as a huge media celebrity yeah. and, and as a really big deal. Ryan, what is life yeah. like for you? you know, do you go to the grocery store by yourself? Do you mow your own grass? These types of things. And I, yeah. I, I want to give you a bit of a peek behind the curtain of what my celebrity lifestyle was like this morning, knowing that the three of you were on the show. I actually set my alarm for 4.45, I put in my AirPods, and I went downstairs and folded laundry so I could listen to your pod that you three pushed out last night. Another great episode. Uh, appreciate it very much, in which, and I, and I won't spoil it too much, you you did debate and discuss why Aaron O'Toole, the leader of Canada's Conservatives, has not hit that question head-on and answered it once and for all, I'm sitting here folding laundry, finding myself agreeing with you three this morning. Carter, let's start with you. Why doesn't Aaron O'Toole just say, I made the comment that he's done the best job in Canada managing COVID like a year ago, and a lot's changed since then. Why, why is he spinning his tires, Mr. O'Toole? Well, we're not entirely sure why. We're trying to balance off whether it was incompetence or, or just some sort of a, a dream that they'd be able to get past this particular issue. Um, I think Corey made the point that maybe by the third time that he was asked the question, the, the, the big heads should have been able to figure out exactly what was going on. Uh, but because they didn't, because they were waiting uh, till now, I think that, you know, O'Toole's now wasted a full day and lost a full day of messaging. Uh, he should have answered the question the first time it was asked. Um, and, and he should have answered it the way you described it. But now he's put himself in a corner. Why wouldn't he just simply say, um, you know, that was a while ago. This is now. I don't agree with Jason Kenney, um, especially because it's not going to cost him any seats anywhere. Uh, I don't know what the deal is. We, we, I don't think we really answered the question. Uh, Ryan, I think instead what we did was we mused about what the potential answers could be because we literally can't understand strategies that are this stupid. So, um, I mean, Zane can a little bit. But the rest I, I have of us, a really good comprehension, absolutely. Yeah, the rest yeah. of us, you know, Corey and I struggle with, with this level of stupidity. Um, so I, I think that we'll see something vaguely resembling that type of answer today. Um, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I, I don't understand what O'Toole was playing at. His seats in Alberta, for the most part, are safe. I mean, obviously, there's six or seven that are in play. Uh, six, I think, that are in play. Um, but he'll probably still take two to three of those. So compared to what he could lose in Ontario by having this thing dog him, um, Ontario and Quebec, I I think that he's ridiculous not jumping on it. Do you three, do any of you three think that what's happening in Alberta right now could impact results of the federal election in Alberta? In other words, do you think that a couple ridings could swing Corey? You're nodding your head. Yeah, I absolutely do. One of the things that I like to remind people of is the conservatives right now in Alberta are polling at about 55%, depends on the poll. That is about four points lower than when the conservatives went into the 2015 election, what they got in 2015. And let's not forget in 2015, it was not a conservative sweep. Now it's, it's an Alberta version of not a conservative sweep, which means there were only a handful of seats that went to other parties. But you know, Calgary Centre, Calgary Confederation, Calgary Skyview, those are all in play in Calgary. Edmonton Griesbach, uh, Edmonton Centre, maybe. Edmonton Strathcona is for sure going to be an NDP hold. Uh, maybe Edmonton Mill Woods on a wild day. And those are the seats that Stephen's talking about. That is an interesting crack in the um, in the kind of conservative hegemony in Alberta, because 2015 was a wave election to the Liberals. This is not a wave election to the Liberals. The Liberals are up in the polls right now. I think most people have a consensus view that they're likely to pull out a minority government here. We'll see. Uh, polls can be wrong, as, as we all know. But um, but if the Conservatives can 
perform well nationally, but start to have their seats chiseled away here in the province, what's going to happen next time there's a wave election? Mm -hmm. You know, that that's the thing that interests me. And about two elections, say the Liberals come storming back or the NDP are all of a sudden in a place to contest for government or the Liberal Democrats are just going to rock over the prairies. Who, who the fuck knows? Right. But when that wave eventually comes, we might not be talking about six or seven seats. We might be talking about a dozen seats, half the seats in Alberta. It might be part of this changing of the guard here in Alberta politically. I did want to say one thing about Aaron O'Toole, though, and, and what is going on uh, with his response or non-response. I think fundamentally what it comes down to is he doesn't have a good read on Alberta. He did it to not piss off conservatives in Alberta. Right. He should have made the cost benefit analysis very quickly and said, OK, this isn't working. I have to answer directly. That's the question three thing Stephen was talking about when he was asked the third time. He should have said, mm -hmm. I'm just going to need to give an answer here. But he tried to avoid giving an answer to not piss off conservatives in Alberta. But that's a bad read because nobody thinks that the, that the government is doing a good job right now. Conservatives in Alberta would have agreed with Aaron O'Toole on that particular matter. And one could argue he's already done that. If if you're if you've already pissed off a lot of conservatives here in Alberta, hence why your polling isn't starting with a five and not a six or a seven, right? You know, you're pandering to Quebec, uh, your hundred day contract to Quebec, your new PC found image after being the true blue leader. Uh, this bait and switch. If you wanted to piss off Alberta and see some leakage on the right, well, welcome, because we've got Maverick here, we've got PPC, and while they may not win any seats, they're certainly going to play spoiler, and there certainly could be the trailer, to Corey's point, towards a future election where erosion leads to you know, viability for more progressive seats because of what these parties have taken away from your right flank. So if you were thinking about not pissing off Alberta, if that was Aaron O'Toole's like core sort of like strategy to avoid the question, what was it, Carter, a dozen times yesterday, uh, comprehensively, avoiding the question a dozen times well guess what man your leakage is already happening on the right and you've already pissed off many albertans that feel like you're you're pandering uh for as a conservative of convenience rather than a conservative of conviction which many thought when o'toole right flanked mckay in that leadership when o'toole was the socon vote transfer that elected sheer in that leadership pre previously to now this new PC found love with Brian Mul Mulrooney stumping with you and telling people that this is not your father's conservative but, party. So but Zane, I got to tell you, there's more leakage to progressives than there are conservatives right now. So even though the PPC is, is strong in Alberta relative to other places, look at the NDP numbers, what they're polling at now relative to where they were polling last election. I, I, we are seeing the provincial scene bleed into the federal politics. Yeah, and yeah, we are true. seeing that largely go to the benefit of progressive parties at this point. But here's the thing, if the PPC keep growing, Corey, like the parallel structure, and I'm not trying yeah. to, you know, ham fist this, could be what is happening to Kenny in Alberta, at least from a purely electoral standpoint, with the right and the left of his party going to, you know, going away, could be the same thing that happens to O'Toole in some ways, or to the conservative movement across the country. Maybe not this cycle to, to actually, you know, create electoral differences in Alberta, but certainly down the road. Uh, this is the quietest I've seen Carter in like the 10 years that I've known him. It's absolutely remarkable. Uh, I, I want I want to talk about the PPC and, and the, the role that they could play in just a second. But uh, of course, this machine is huge. And so we have to break for a second for a quick mention of our sponsors just because the this show is so massive carter of course we have this we have many bills to play uh, to pay we have several employees both in front of and behind the scenes and and so i need to i need to, to know just uh, carter the machine is so big i don't have time for your take on our advertising i have to get right to it and i have to remind our massive audience that the team at kubi energy is providing solar energy solutions to power your life and you got to follow them on Instagram. I love this post the other day. If if you envision what Kubi Energy does as just solar panels on a roof, it's time to reimagine the possibilities of integrating sustainable energy into what you do. Check this out. Uh, you can find it on their Instagram at Kubi Energy, K-U-B-Y. This is the Kubi Cube. This is a dropped off, essentially a sea can, really, absolutely covered in panels, batteries inside, plus whatever else you want in there. They can lock them up securely. They're custom built for your application. I mean, whether you're in ag and you want to keep, you know, your water troughs with the water melted in the middle of the winter, I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about there, but I do know that farmers use them. Hey, whether you have a cabin off the grid and you want to bring power into it, the Kubi Cube has a million applications 
You can learn more by talking to Jake and his team at kubienergy.ca. The team at Park Power wants to remind you that you can choose where you get your internet, electricity, and natural gas in the province of Alberta. Park Power is your friendly local utilities provider. Check them out online today at parkpower.ca to compare electricity. Learn more about the Green Power Program. You know that they have customers that are integrating solar and Park Power is providing a rebate opportunity that not every company does. You can ask Chris what it means when you visit parkpower.ca. The promo code 2021 Realtalk gets you $70 off your first bill. And our friends at Friesen Brothers with their 16 locations across the province of Alberta want you to know you have a limited time right now to get in on the 40 plus year tradition that is the Alberta Beef Roundup. You can learn more at Friesen.com. It's 44th annual Alberta Beef Roundup gives customers all the way through to September 23rd a chance to get your hands on a whole hip of fresh Alberta beef butchered exactly how you want it. Fill your freezer today with a custom cut pack at Friesen Brothers, Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Our guests this Real Talk Roundtable, Corey Hogan, Zane Velji, Stephen Carter, together they are the strategists. It's one of my favorite podcasts. If you guys would try a little harder, be a little that, funnier. That seems like a downgrade from how you introduced us off the top of the show. Where well, you said like it was what happened? Your you pissed? I mean, what, what would these, the, these 30 minutes didn't go well for you? I'm just, the uh, yeah, the like, outro we, is going to be a disaster for us at this rate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the, I mean, thinking like Kenny, what, what the hell? Ho- hopefully, you hopefully promo you can... the Hurley Burley while we're here. Yeah, well, like, Hur- Hurley was pretty good, although David Hurley. No, he for... was not. Come on. <laughs> stop <laughs> talking like that. Hurley needs to get better internet is what he needs to get. I mean, this guy's basically like steered federal liberal campaigns and he's on every big talk show in Canada and at the same time I think he's using dial up so we'll grind his gears a little bit there Uh, but you're right the who's who of Canadian podcasting do appear here on Real Talk and that's something we're really proud of Uh, the People's Party of Canada the PPC you look at some polls I mean they're flirting with 10 percent support if the numbers are to be believed led by Maxime Bernier Carter what role are they going to play in this federal election coming up on Monday they're the park power of this election. They're going to grow. They're going to provide energy to to the entire campaign. Uh, I don't know how park, I don't know how park power is going to feel about this one, pal. <laughs> I thought, and I, I think they're more the Kubi energy, Carter. Kubi energy, Kubi energy. Sorry, my bad. They're more the Kubi energy. They're the block of power that's really making things happen uh, through Thank this you. campaign. They're the ones who are melting the ice in our eavesdrops. Thanks, guys. And. <laughs> <laughs> we cost you Dairy Queen last time. We're gonna hang on. Hang on, my phone's ring. Hang on, I, there's an emergency yeah, call. So, yeah, right. sorry about that. Yeah, thanks, no, guys. I mean, I mean, Bernier is reveling in this. He's loving this. He's he's stealing away votes at every opportunity. And let's be clear, I don't believe in things called vote split. I believe you earn every vote. Every every party, every election starts at zero, and they have to earn their votes. And and right now, Bernier's earning his votes with a zest and glee. It is fun to watch from from uh, from my side. I mean, I'm watching O'Toole bleed all of his votes to the right. And it, it reminds me, I mean, it really wouldn't be possible, I don't think, without the the assist of Jason Kenney. Because Jason Kenney is dividing his the center of conservatism in Canada right in half. And the rest of the, the country's conservatives are saying, yeah, we'll follow that. And it doesn't matter that Mad Max looks an awful lot like Donald Trump. Literally. Uh, we'll follow him wherever he wants to take us. Because, yeah, we love the idea of taking horse medicines for our for our uh, for our diseases and walking around with no masks because it's an infringement on our rights trademark um you know like that's ridiculous posturing by by max and it's uh it's fun to watch though because it's they're not going to elect any seats bernie's still going to be in the wilderness but he is really going to hurt uh o'toole zane what do you think he's gotten He's gotten multiple assists. Let, let's walk through it. Kenny, certainly, for the discontent that he's seeing in Alberta and, and what's shaking out on the right side and, and kind of growing a volume of folks, both in terms of like population, but also in terms of how loud they're getting. Uh, and that anger is a through line. He's also getting an assist from Aaron O'Toole, who's, you know, at least in recent weeks, picked the, picked the PC lane and is kind of saying, screw it, I'm going to the center. If that's area that Trudeau is going to leave unoccupied, maybe I have a chance with my carbon tax, with my, you know, plans for things that tr- conservatives traditionally have not had, I'm going to move to the center and try to not disqualify myself for that main basket of votes in the GTA, Quebec, Lower Mainland, et cetera. 
The third assist he's getting, however, is from Justin Trudeau. When, when you have Trudeau being his party's own pit bull on the stumps, fighting with anti-vaxxers, looking at that fracture in society and pounding it even further, the net beneficiary of that, because of the two assists I mentioned earlier, is Maxime Bernier. He's finding those folks. He's now finding a political home for them. If they were freelancing, oh, you know, cover yourself in purple because we've got a home for you in a political uh, spectrum as well in this country. So multiple assists have effectively led to the reality that is Maxime Bernier. Does he get any seats? Who the heck knows? Does he play spoiler? I'm not prescient, but I think, yeah, he does, at least in a half a dozen to a dozen seats going forward. The prescient one is Carter. So make sure at the end, Ryan, you ask him for his prediction on election night, and then let's just all bet millions of dollars on the exact opposite outcome. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're going to get to predictions coming up in, in just a little bit. But, Corey, what is, the, what is the growth of the People's Party of Canada? I mean, we hear some people reporting, obviously, anecdotally, that as they walk their dogs around the neighborhoods, they're shocked at how many purple signs they're seeing. What does it tell you about the electorate? Yeah, I'm one of those people. I don't have a dog, but I put my children on a leash and we see where the adventure takes us. But yeah, there's purple signs. I live in inner city Calgary and uh, I walk around and I think, holy shit, what is happening around here? Yeah. And I guess it's important to to kind of lay out that the PPC is a symptom, not the disease. It's the result of a lot of very crazy things going on in, uh, you know, the discourse of our time, social media, it's a long-term problem and we're going to need to find a solution to it. It's not going to go away after this election because the problems predated the PPC and they will postdate the PPC, but this is the vehicle that people are using for their anger right now. I want to make a bit of a counterintuitive pitch that maybe it's a good thing we have the PPC because what we saw in the United States was a total takeover of the Republican Party by this lunatic right. And what we're seeing here in Canada is the lunatic right has decided to join a different federal party. And well, we don't know how this will play out long term. It's possible if the conservatives lose, they're going to swing that way. If, if they don't, it will be because all of the lunatic right has already left the conservatives and we can have a moderate, sensible conservative party in the long term. Um, but we talk, Carter doesn't believe in vote splits, which is ridiculous. Uh, votes no, are not ridiculous. Votes are votes, splittable for sure. No, they're but, not. Um, you can only mark one party on your ballot. You get to choose one person. That, they're the group that earned your vote. Everybody else did not earn your vote. All right. Well, we'll just not do the thought exercise where it's, hey, if there were 50 left wing parties and one right wing party, would vote splitting be real? But let's move past let that. Me, let me interrupt say, for a second, Corey, and, and we'll get back to you, I promise. But Carter, you, you, you keep you keep talking about this mayoral campaign, and we'll, we'll talk about this, uh, but this mayoral campaign you're working on. Um, have you revealed which campaign it is? I mean, is that is that a big secret or can we talk about it? Be, let, let me ask you this hypothetically. Uh, if you're working on the Jody Gondek campaign for mayor down in yeah. Calgary and Kent yeah. and Kent Hare declares with six weeks to go that he's entering the race, do you still believe that vote splitting is not real? Yeah, totally. If I don't if I don't earn the votes, if Kent Hare earns seven or eight votes, which is I think where he's tracking towards, then then and those are the seven or eight votes that caused us to lose, it's because I didn't do my job. I didn't earn those votes. There should be a non-entity in my campaign because our candidate should be so good. And that, in fact, is the situation, right? And the same thing with Jeff Davison and the same thing with um, with uh, Grace Yan. These people all can earn the same number of votes. But if we aren't earning enough to win, all that, all that a large number of candidates does in an in election race is reduce the number of votes required to win. That's all it does. Everything else is just people looking for excuses afterwards because they're weak and they lost. And they're adding up votes that they didn't earn and say, see, if this happened and that happened, that's loser talk. And that's why Corey's so familiar with it. Uh, Corey, I, I jumped in on you. Take it back. <laughs> well, where I wanted to go with that, now I want to go a different place and boot Stephen Carter squarely in his balls. But where I was going with that is that if these parties are going to be outlets for that kind of frustration, um, They've got to have a true outlet for their frustration. And it's and in some ways, it's many. It's very unfortunate that we didn't have our last first pass the post election in 2015, that yeah. Justin Trudeau broke that promise so badly, because I would probably rather have a 5% fringe in the House of Commons of the PPC than to have the PPC and the CPC down the road say we're going to come together and just essentially be a a very big PPC, which is what I think the fear is if our electoral politics drive them to that sort yeah. of practical solution. Well, and that's what we did in Alberta. Right. We took the crazies and we put them in charge. 
I heard uh, the United Conservatives described once by a conservative insider, or arguably by the conservative insider, but I won't name him. He, he jokingly said that the United Conservatives have all the corruption of the PCs with all the craziness of the Wild Rose. And I thought that I thought that that was actually pretty bang on. Uh, I don't know which Max Bernier tweet to highlight here, but but I will point this one out. He's tweeting uh, just a couple of days ago that Jason Kenney has just declared war on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, says Max. I'll be in Alberta this weekend for the last stretch of the election campaign to join Albertans in their fight against this despot. So an interesting take from Maxime Bernier. Jesus Fifth, Christ. And 5,100 people liked it. I want to just send that list to the RCMP and just be like, start your reading. <laughs> Research place. <laughs> can we can we acknowledge that we were the conservatives, but Canada as a whole was 0.1 percent away in a leadership race from electing this guy as leader yeah. of a mainstream party? This would have been the standard bearer yeah. of the conservative fucking party of Canada in 2019. And maybe you could say that he's been radicalized over the last two years, but holy shit, to have someone tweet that. To look at the fractures in society, uh, compound it with anger, compound it with all sorts of phobias, uh, racism, you know, uh, uh, you know, transphobia in the past, uh, you know, just unbelievable that that this was a person that the conservatives and this country were flirting with to hold leadership of a mainstream political party. That's just a rant. That's all I have to say. It's just crazy. Well, it's good. Brian, it's good. That's all. But and 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 it's an it because we've 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 debated this and we've asked you know guests about it in past day and I and I and I do think you're right. It's shocking how close Max Bernier came to winning that leadership. But I I don't believe that. I think that Max Bernier is playing a character right now. Uh, I don't know him personally, but I don't believe he is this guy. I think he's a political opportunist. I don't know if the three of you agree or not. Well, I think it started that way. But can I tell you? Uh, as someone who works in columns, when you find yourself writing a message, telling a message, speaking it, you start to believe it over time. And this guy it has obviously, you. yeah, this guy is obviously deep in the tank now for, for this view of conservatism. Now, could he be deprogrammed? Maybe, probably, but he doesn't seem to have any interest in it right right now. And he's happy to ride this wave of of anger and, and just lunatic. And, and everyone's a constitutional scholar these days, my God, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but so he's Brian, basically to, to your point though, can I can I just say, you know, playing a character, I, I think that's an easy off ramp that we give some of these folks. Yeah. But when we look at what's actually happening in our society with the with the supporters that are kind of draping themselves in the in the PPC uh, sort of colors and, and, and party, we are seeing a process in, in front of our eyes of fake news and misinformation and disinformation to generally trusting but vulnerable people changing them. Like this is what happens. The entire QAnon thing over the last two years, how many people, and we may not know them, but how many people have we heard from that you're saying, oh, you know, my, my aunt, she's all totally QAnon now, or she's been radicalized yeah. or she's an anti-vaxxer. They've become this way. I feel like the, 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 the off ramp that we give to our leaders and frankly to folks to say that, you know, oh yeah, this is just, you know, a character that they're playing to take advantage. No, to Corey's point, like, you know, a lot of people are increasingly vulnerable and susceptible to this misinformation, disinformation. This is quite a sad story when we think about it in, on a humanistic level to, to kind of be radicalized in this way. And, and one of the things that maybe I'll get on my soapbox for half a second that I actually really hated in this campaign was our prime minister outright, still our prime minister, liberal leader fighting with anti-vaxxers. Do I have any sympathy for them? No, but I'm just a guy on a fucking, you know, radio show, you know, spouting my shit off. I'm not the leader of our country or seeking to reelect myself as a leader. And to see him pounding on those fractures, deepening those fractures in society, and then have to deal with that shit, whether he's a prime minister or not on the back end, I think is just so against not just political brand, but against what's fundamentally happening in society, which is a group of people that are scared, that are vulnerable, at least a sliver, and that are finding this as some sort of recourse or finding a tribe or a home to say, this is what I believe in, this is who I am now. Uh, and, and then driving that division even further when we're in the midst of a public health crisis and you're antagonizing 
vaccines even more. I mean, I'll get off the soapbox, Ryan, no. but I think giving folks an easy pass on playing a character, whether they're leaders or supporters of a movement like this, I think is is actually the last thing we, we need. Zane, people don't actually realize I do the show sitting on a soapbox every single morning, and so I encourage <laughs> you to stay on there as long as you'd like. But to be clear, uh, you're referencing, correct, the Prime Minister's retort uh, to a pretty brutal comment about his wife, from a demonstrator when Justin Trudeau uh, quipped, shouldn't you be outside a hospital protesting somewhere? Correct. That's what you're talking about. That's, that's what you that's, that's what you were disappointed to see. Part of the constellation of comments. It started with the prime minister on that late evening when he got protested for the first time coming out and saying these people have had a tough year, too, which I thought was the right message for a leader. And then literally in 24 fucking hours, that message flipped to look at these anti-vaxxer mobs, these like people that represent a fringe. Someone probably told him in some strategy meeting that morning or that evening, it's like, hey, dude, you pound on this and it's good for you. Your campaign has been total dog shit thus far. Keep pounding on this. Change your tone. And he fucking did. And that is what I hated to see from from my prime minister for someone seeking reelection to, to be a leader of this country. Oh, my God. Give me the false equivalency be, be stick. Where do I get the false equivalency stick? I mean, we're talking about Alex Jones, Tucker Carlson, Ezra Levant, Danielle Smith on a station that, you, you know, Ryan used to be on, all going to the point of taking horse medicines or medicines that weren't intended for, for COVID. These aren't characters that they're playing on television anymore. Uh, yeah, the prime minister took a harsher line. The prime minister attacked some some anti-maskers or anti-vaxxers at a rally. Boo-hoo. These people are on a platform three hours a day spouting racist diatribes into people who wish to believe them about QAnon, about, about right-wing conspiracy, about taking medicines for horses, for COVID. Don't mask up. Take this ivermectin or whatever the hell it's called. Don't do the right thing, do the wrong thing. And there's, you know, I appreciate that the prime minister could have looked more like a leader, but let us please not use the false equivalency of these two things are the same. Tucker Carlson's a lunatic. Ezra Levant is crazy. And Max Bernier is not playing a character anymore. These are not hey, excuses. Hey, let's all be careful forward. not to light any matches with all these straw dogs that Carter just sprinkled around oh the room here. Oh, my God. Fucking ridiculous. Oh, my God. So long term, you. Zane's you, right. Long term, we do need wrong. to bring people together. Long term, these these things are not solved by creating deeper schisms between these groups. I'll tell you, and I, I like the, I'm sure there's a good Alberta listenership base here. Nothing actually makes me want to say fuck you uh, yeah. and almost come to the defense of uh, of the premier. Then mm. when people outside of the province take these very strong lines, like Canada needs less Alberta. I saw that one on Twitter the other day. I wanted to, I don't know, virtually punch them in the face because it's, it's kind of a tribal instinct. When you're a member of a group and that group is under attack, it can really harden those lines. It can make Elbows things up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden to that point we were making earlier about you start communicating the thing, you start defending the thing and you start feeling the thing. And there were a lot of Canadians out there who I just refuse to believe are unsalvageable. Right. There is 10 percent that are supporting the PPC in, in Alberta in some of these polls, in nationally 10 percent in some of these polls. And I'm not willing to write those people off, uh, but they're going to th that division is going to last for a very long time if we have them being treated like pinatas and their views like pinatas. I'm not saying we indulge the Tucker Carlson's of the world. What I'm saying is we need to be able to distinguish between the people who've been whipped up by uh, these idiots into a mob from, uh, you know, from the person who's whipping them up. There's a, yeah. a, quite a compliment here on our live chat. I just want to throw this into the mix. The watcher says, I viscerally don't like him, but Stephen Carter's right. So <laughs> I don't. That is generally the lane he is going yeah, for. I mean, right? I'm, not, person, I'm not unfamiliar person, with that. In terms of a person who's picked a lane, Stephen Carter is golden in that territory. And I feel like that. The watcher has described that lane perfectly. Yeah. So ultimately, you know, Canadians, I suppose, and, and this comes down to the, that sort of idea that that in, in a utopia or in a perfect world, people would vote for something as opposed to voting against something. You, you would vote uh, out of being inspired or a sense of, of positivity uh, as opposed to voting to punish 
Carter, I'm trying to create the utopia no. type scenario. What the fuck but that's are you not how about? people hey, I what bring positivity. I'm not inherently negative. My soul doesn't right look now? like I've been happening? smoking for what forty years. I'm not are the Marlboro okay? man and the end are result okay? decayed lung equivalent of public commentary. So let me ask you on Monday. On I'll Monday, have you been white hatted, Zane? Is that an act? You got white hatted? Who white hatted? That's, nep- I, that's nepotism no, no, no. if I've ever you seen can't, it. You can't white hat a Calgarian. That's the rule. White hats yeah, are that is the rule. Towns. That's, I, very, uh, this that's is a, a good fake, point. This is a fake white hat. I'm declaring victory, though. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that before the, the victory. End of the victory 1919. Ultimately, uh, and Carter, we'll start with you. Uh, what are Canadians, what message will Canadians send on Monday? Uh, I think they're going to send the we don't like any of you, so we'll stick with who we had message. Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't going to be an overwhelming victory for anybody. Um, at the end of this, I, I think that the best that Trudeau can hope for is a similar place to where he was when he started. And that's just going to beg the question, what the hell did we do this all for? Uh, especially during the fourth wave. But he'll have to deal with that in government um, because he he's probably not going to lose uh, to Aaron O'Toole and the clown show that's running his campaign. What do you think, Corey? I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it, but I think that the Liberals will pull it out. The regional polling for them looks solid enough. If the polls are even, you know, within ballpark of of what you would uh, what you're seeing, uh, if that's correct, then it's going to be a Liberal minority. Um, it's possible O'Toole pulls it off, though. It's certainly possible. In 2019, the polls did underrepresent conservative support by, I think, three or four points, and that would certainly be enough to put this whole thing in play. And regional numbers are a bit smaller, so you can't always trust them. Right now, if you go to the aggregators, it's about even, you know, about the same support for the conservatives and liberals. Liberal votes more efficient, conservatives more likely to show up. Polling sometimes underrepresents conservatives. It's a bit of a toss up. Zane, are you expecting something this weekend, some sort of a bomb to drop? Are you expecting any sort of last minute, last ditch efforts on behalf of any campaigns? Do you think there might be another big story before or between now and Monday? I don't. I feel like it's all been said and done largely. That's not to say someone won't try. I feel like when I say I don't, I mean, I don't think it will resonate. I don't think there's enough soak time or runway for it to actually be absorbed by the electorate and then to ultimately change their voting pattern or decision. Um, so no, I don't expect any sort of story to, to kind of land and, and, and change uh, the narrative in the final days. If there's one thing I am maybe not betting on, but I, I suspect without any data, which is what we do on our podcast, uh, reckless speculation is that I think there's gonna be a bit of a movement, kind of like we saw in 2015, where on, on the eve of the election saying liberal minority was risky and that it ended up being a liberal majority, I feel like we might be there again. I think there's folks that have really kind of given Trudeau or might give Trudeau the message of saying, we don't love you as much as you think we do, but we like you better than the other guys because your policy lane that you've picked is is probably the one that we need going forward. And we didn't appreciate that you threw this victory lap election together, but if it's a choice, it's you. And I think that could lead to strong minority, if not, I dare say it, majority territory for Trudeau, uh, which by the way, if he gets, will have been the longest, most arduous walk to a majority that I've seen any prime minister take. Uh, but but there we are. I think that's that's where we might end up on, on Monday night. If the liberals lose the election, is it the most obvious statement in the world that that's it for Justin Trudeau's uh, political career as leader of the party? If yeah, the liberals yeah. lose this election, it will be the biggest own goal in Canadian political history. I mean, it, it is the, it is a football to the groin that people will be talking about until the end of Canada. You know, well, like literally, just, this I will just, be. I just want to mention forever. that is groin mention number six. For I was going to say, <laughs> what's going on? A lot like, of like, like groin, like, this real. It's, it's, yeah, it's troubling. Do you want to open up to it us? Really we, we, we're here for you, man. Maybe we're have something here for to you talk if about. You want to talk about something? Yeah. 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 issue. A perfect inroad if we only had an ED sponsor, but but we don't because unfortunately, I can't relate. Unfortunately, I just wouldn't be able to endorse such a product. Uh, oh, give me a break. <laughs> we do have an absolutely massive audience uh, across the country, but you're right. The biggest part of this enormous audience come to us from the province of Alberta. I don't want to take for granted that everybody's going to know what's going on in the mayoral races, but we are about a month away from municipal elections. And I'm just curious as we get set to wrap here, how, uh, the three of you, I, I, and I'm sure that you're paying uh, tepid attention to Edmonton's mayoral 
mayoral race. Uh, Calgary, of course, as well, with I think more than 25 candidates, isn't it? Both of them, the incumbents are leaving. So why don't we start with Calgary? Carter, you're working on a campaign. Where do you yeah. see this one going? I, we understand that, of course, you're going to play your trumpet here and say all the things, and then we'll, we'll get to some real analysis from your colleagues. But you first. 28 candidates is too many candidates for people to understand. So they'll narrow the field. And that's uh, the same type of thing that happened in 2010, where you had, I think, 18 candidates in that race. Uh, when they narrow the field, they choose from uh, the leading contenders. And I think that that really benefits our candidate. And I'd be shocked if Corey and Zane uh, took any other line because I pay them quite a bit of money uh, to just echo my my comments on mayoralty politics. Okay. Right, guys? Uh, Zane, you uh, you have uh, steered a successful mayoral campaign before for the incumbent who's leaving. Is, is Jody Gondek going to win this one? Is Jeff Davison going to win it? Is Jeremy Farkas going to win it? Is Kent Hare going to win it? What's going to happen? Uh, I feel like it's an anyone anyone but Farkas race for many people on the center and on the left. So the question is, is Gondek going to be the, the heir apparent in that race? So far, it seems like she is. Uh, but I believe in vote splitting. So who the heck knows, Carter? Like things could slice out 3%, 4%. Candidates could come and take 1% or 2% if they remain on the ballot, uh, if they announce by the 20th. And, and I think it's going to be a close race. And I think folks underestimate the ceiling of Farkas in Calgary. I, he's not our standard bearer conservative. He's confusing to people. He comes from a different socioeconomic background. He's got different elements of his personality. When you meet with him, he can moderate himself. Those are all things that kind of increase that ceiling for a traditional conservative candidate to, to probably a little bit higher than that mid-30s point that many would wishfully uh, think that, uh, that it stands at. Corey, where does it go? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Zane said there. There is probably going to be a rationalization of the vote in Calgary, as there often is in a municipal election, where polling in the next couple of weeks, especially after we're out of this federal election, will really dictate what the outcome is going to be, because people will look at it and say, oh, look at that. Gondek's only, let's just say, five points back from Farkas. I'm an anybody but Farkas voter. So, uh, yeah, I was going to vote for Davison or I was going to vote for Hare and I'm, I'm going to go vote for Gondek. I think that's that's the most likely outcome. One of the things that I just want to make a plug for, because I always do when people talk about mayor politics, is like mayor is a glorified meeting chair. OK, oh, go out and go. think about council as well. I just can't for the life of me understand why we put so much effort into this uh, mayoral like councillor at large position. How our cities are governed in the next four years is really going to be dictated by these other races that are happening out there in, in the wards across Calgary and across Edmonton, because there's so few fucking incumbents, especially in Calgary, they're all running for mayor, right? And, and that's really going to determine what municipal politics looks like for the next four years, not the mayoral one, paradoxically. Farkas could win and have a progressive council and not be able to get a damn thing done. But mm. we can all agree that the may I mean, the mayor, even as a figurehead, I mean, I'm thinking of Rob Ford in Toronto as an example, like a, a city cares about who its mayor is. Well, sure. And they get that really nice giant necklace and they can they can go cut a bunch of ribbons and they can make a bunch of nice talks. But if you want to get shit done in politics, you need the votes and the votes come from the council. I'm not uh, sure. how. Say, go ahead, Zane. I would say that in this particular moment in time in Alberta politics, the symbolism of that mayor will really matter, especially when we're losing Iveson and uh, Nenshi. The symbol and what that mayor sort of represents on a broader brand perspective, when brand Alberta has been damaged so much over the course of the last 18 months, I yeah. think the symbolism and the hope and the energy of that mayor, to Corey's point, uh, politically, I don't disagree. But I think it's going to have a special meaning, especially in the intervening period for so many, when, when we still have to stick with the conservative government of some, uh, of some kind. I think for many, they're going to channel their, their energies into what the symbol of the mayors in Calgary and Edmonton mean to brand Alberta going forward. And I feel like uh, that is a big part. I can't say it's a big part of how people are going to vote, but I think it's a big part of the outcome that will happen should the, the elections in Calgary and Edmonton in particular uh, go a certain way. All right, Zane, I know you've got to go because you're kind of a big deal. So I, I'm just going to ask the three of you this. Who's going to win in Edmonton? Just a name. Carter, who's going to win the mayoral race in Edmonton? Did Carter? Sohi. Sohi? Corey, who do you think? I was thinking. His, his was brain thinking. froze. Yeah, yeah I was so thinking. Was like, I was like, uh, buffering, buffering. Corey, who's going to win? Sohi. And Zane? 
Uh, I think he's one of the the kindest, most uh, empathetic people I've ever met in politics. I'm Richard so he's going to win in Edmonton. Okay, these three are reasonably smart, and they co-host a decent podcast called The Strategist. <laughs> and I encourage you all to subscribe and listen in all seriousness. Uh, it's a weekly tradition I do not miss. Thanks for doing this, fellas. It's always a total pleasure. Thanks, Jespo. You got it. That's Zane Velji, Corey Hogan, and Stephen Carter. Together, they are the strategists. Uh, You can send us your thoughts to talk at ryanjesperson.com. I love this from Jen talking about ED meds. Says, you don't need it till you do, Jespo. That's some good insight, and we could probably find some way to make that a metaphor about the segment, the interview itself, but maybe we'll just let it stand alone. See what I did there? At Westworld.ca, you'll find more about the offerings that this family-owned business has available right now for more than 40 years. Westworld Computers has been your independently owned Apple experts. And right now, they've got their Back to the Future school and work sale going on. It means when you buy a new Mac with Apple Care Plus at Westworld, they're going to give you up to $100 to spend on awesome accessories. A new iPad Pro gets you $50 in instant savings on accessories. And if you're looking for work and you're really hardwired in an Apple way, you know what I mean. Sales and service opportunities, you can fix anything. Maybe you know how to teach people how to make the most of the software. If you're a customer service guru, they'd love to talk to you. You can send them an email to employment at westworld.ca. Make sure you let them know that you heard about the opportunity on Real Talk. Mike and his team at Eden Landscaping are getting set for fall as they wrap up their final summer jobs, bringing outdoor spaces to life. They will soon transition into the design process. It's a one-stop shop when you work with Eden Landscaping, a custom landscape builder, more than 20 years of on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and area. You don't have to source and landscape architect and then track down a general contractor they do it all and they don't stop until you're satisfied at landscapeedmonton.ca it's eden landscaping this weekend on saturday in fact at the newcastle dairy queen it'll be my pleasure to attend a check presentation where they will award a total of twenty two thousand seven hundred and seventy eight dollars to the wakoto Inn society employees real talkers helped raise enough funds for two full retreats for indigenous women that have survived residential schools and cancer the first one's coming up by the way the weekend of october 8th you made it happen by showing up to the six dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park buying ice cream cones through the month of august don't forget it's fall and that means that the pumpkin pie and pecan pie blizzards are back at the dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park applause thank you i have i have i have earned the moderate approval of editorial producer sarah hoyles with my pronunciation of uh, oh, oh and the studio audience liked it too Oh, yay, not bad, not bad. Can I get that rousing ad music bed back, Sam, while I remind people how proud we are to partner? See, I'm kind of going like chill right now because we're about to ramp things up in maybe the longest edition of Trash Talk this show has ever seen. Trash Talk is presented by our friends at Local Waste. And Local Waste is a family-owned company that for a quarter century has been finding solutions for entrepreneurs, businesses, big and small, when it comes to garbage and recycling pickup. But they also work with residences, people that are doing yard cleanups. Maybe there's an estate scenario where you've got to make some tough decisions and you got to find a way to transport it all. Local Waste, the team of Mikel, Lauren, and Chris would love to help you out. You can find them at localwaste.ca. Every Friday, Local Waste also gives us a chance to blow off a little steam. It's a little something we call Trash Talk! This one from Lauren who says, Stay home if you need a massive fifth wheel RV kind of thingy with all the bells and whistles. Why don't you just stay home? If you need a generator at your campsite that you fire up at 8 a.m., just stay home. Home. If you need to consistently blast music to drown out your thoughts and your own self-hatred, just stay home. Bottom line, you're not camping. Plus, you're ruining everybody else's experience. Just stay home. That from Lorne, a tenter. 
How about this one from Aaron who says, The most impressing and depressing part of Monday's Real Talk episode was the acute acknowledgement of why we're all assholes. When you had on that conservative strategist, Elise Mills, and, and people put their fingers in their ears or tuned out, suddenly wanted people who they may not agree with to listen to them, to their reason when it came to their opinions, and then they couldn't understand why they didn't, so they too shut out what they didn't want to hear. And then you had that guy, Kalen Robertson, on who had been brought down the rabbit hole working for Rebel Media and everybody praised him. It was quite an eye-opening show, says Aaron. I thank you for this. It speaks volumes between the conversations and the reactions to them. That from Aaron. How about this from Marie who says on September 13th, nurses were being spit on at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton as they tried to enter to look after their patients. Where is the protection for these people that have given their all over the last 18 months? Why are these people not being charged with assault? When did our society become this low? These healthcare workers that continue to show up for their shifts, are we prepared to have those numbers shrink even more than they already have? She says, I've seen comments from real talkers as well as on social media about support, but that's not the same as protection. I'm not supportive of a confrontation with protesters, but we need protection from this kind of assault. That from Marie. This one from Brendan, who says, I'm a proud real talker, and for years I've been a proud conservative, like a fundraising, donating, door knocking, membership holding conservative. Last night, I tore up my card. Seeing Jason Kenny bumble his way through waves two through four of the pandemic, disappear to Europe when Albertans were demanding a display of leadership, return with some fucked up gift card scheme to try to buy his way out of a flaccid vaccination plan, and then sorry, not sorry, four million of us. That had me on the brink, but the pennant, the pennant pushed me over the edge. The way this petty, petulant, tiny little twerp thumbs his nose at the electorate is unmatched in Canadian politics. People, humans are suffering in the ICU or dealing with delayed surgeries or dying because this guy opened up Alberta wide open so he could flip pancakes for the cameras and the donors. And weeks later, with our healthcare system teetering on collapse, people exhausted due to that best summer ever plan, Dr. Dina Hinshaw said it herself, he pins up a victory Calgary stampede pennant for his Facebook Live, doubling down on the disgraceful past two months. Fuck that guy. I'm out. That from Brendan. What about this one from Gordo, who says, I found out this weekend that my cousin, a longtime climate change denier, now a vaccine denier, has COVID. He went to emerge because he was struggling to breathe, but he didn't want to get a COVID test, so he left without one. I also found out that he and two of my uncles have been wearing ball caps lined with foil to protect their brains from the 5G. These two uncles have engineering degrees. One of them is an electrical engineer. He says, how do you rationalize with people like this? I'm told that talking down to them and calling them fucking pricks is not helpful, but explaining how they're wrong is also not helpful because facts can just be dismissed as my opinion. The Socratic method doesn't work with these people, and I'm at a loss. Meantime, our ICUs are so full, I see stars flying over my house, shuttling patients dying of COVID from Red Deer to Calgary. I hear doctors are actually breaking down in tears over this. I've done my Part says Gordo. I got vaccinated the first day I could. I socially distanced. I stayed home. I wore a mask without complaints. I did my part, and ignorant assholes are pulling us apart with their bullshit, and I'm tired. That from Gordo. How about this one from Allison, who says, I get that the vaccine passport's going to be hard for businesses and people have strong feelings about it, but when I see businesses justify choosing not to follow these mandatory public health measures with the rationale I'm going to let adults be adults, I'm not a babysitter and my head's going to explode. She says, I'm an ICU nurse. The one thing we're not short of in this world is idiots. As an ER nurse, I don't get my dinner time stories from the rational and considerate. If I have to tell a grown man why you shouldn't have sex in a field full of thistle, I'm not holding out much hope for the rest of society. Allison says, by the way, the sex in the thistle field is a real example, not something I made up. He then proceeded to put hand sanitizer on his balls to try to clean them. And if you know anything about hospital hand sanitizer, you know he was crying for his mama seconds later. 
None of this took place in the privacy of an assigned room, nor was he wearing anything on the bottom half. That from Allison, with an unbelievable addition to the fixation on groin injuries on today's Real Talk. This one from Tanya, who says, I have long believed that hyperpartisanship is a dangerous cancer in politics, but this is beyond belief. People brush off ethical scandals or billion-dollar boondoggles because the consequences are so abstract. Nobody's really hurt, and everybody does it. Not anymore. A mother doesn't get her cancer surgery now. Kids with cancer might not get critical care. An unvaccinated uncle living in rural areas dies of COVID because he didn't need the vaccine. How has the premier and his government not resigned in shame? Tanya says, I've always considered my vote up for grabs, but to channel one of my mom's favorite sayings, it'll be a frosty Friday in hell before I vote conservative again. This one from Linda, who says, I just want to say that even though everybody's pissed at Jason Kenney, no matter what side you're on of the spectrum, conservatives will still win almost every seat in Alberta on Monday. I live in rural Alberta. I cannot get people to explain the stronghold that this party has on voters. They're incensed. They insist the premier needs to be turfed, but they still believe the NDP is the devil incarnate. Linda says, as a retired teacher who lived through the Klein years, there was zero sympathy from the public for our wage rollbacks. I've been called a communist. I've been blocked from local community pages. I can't imagine what our healthcare workers are feeling. Nenshi's comments, the mayor out of Calgary, said it all. And this one as we wrap from Patty, who says, Ryan, I'm writing you at 3.30 in the morning. Not because I've been out enjoying a Thursday evening somewhere. Not at all. In fact, I want to thank Jason Kenny and his sidekicks, Thing 1 and 2, for awakening in me something I had no idea that existed. A real appreciation of wild animals in captivity. Yeah, I've just been binge-watching various videos of parrots and cockatoos and finches and, and ringnecks and, and these creatures, I don't mean the birds, have done the impossible. As a result of their complete and total abdication and dereliction of duty, their ability to take this province and flush all the joy, happy and hope out has made me realize they're no different than the parrots I've just watched. These assholes have an uncanny ability to repeat words without complimenting their, uh, comprehending their meaning. Much like parrots that fly in circles, avoiding landing on solid ground. Much like avians, they fly around swooping in here or there without a care in the world until they hear the call of their flock. The message they receive finally is to stop dive bombing the people that have helped us get through this unmitigated clusterfuck. That'd be a great band name. She says the doctors, the nurses, every last person in the medical field has listened to their fucking squawking for months, and so have we. So they hear the call of the flock, and they they align on their various perches, and they have their special toys to amuse them, and they have one common thing in particular. For the first time in Real Talk history, I'm about to hit the end of the nine-minute music bed on Trash Talk, but here's where Patty takes it. The flock is no longer united. There's no alpha there. They work together and play together. No need to show anyone who's boss you know geese mate for life if their mate is shot they'll sit with that dead bird and mourn the humane thing to do is to actually dispatch the mate she says i think the humane thing to do with these shitheads is to dispatch them metaphorically as quickly as possible thanks to the youtube algorithm i'm now getting videos of pet monkeys with diapers on my feed never know who you might see squawking and shitting up there thanks for real talk says patty patty Thanks for that one. I guess you can send us an email anytime to be considered for trash talk to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Monday is election day. Get out and vote. We're going to have some fun with it. A panel of comedians, Adrian Fish, Howie Miller, and Derek Sagan. We'll talk to Giller award-winning author Ian Williams about his new book, Disorientation. And we're going to learn more about EVs, electric cars, and trucks. In the meantime, have an amazing weekend. Share these interviews with anybody who might not need to hear them and make sure you smash that like button thanks for subscribing you can get our sunday email by signing up on our website ryanjesperson.com that's where you'll find real talk merch as well we love you beauties we'll talk to you monday